Hi there, my name is David Kenny. Welcome to our program, Light from Above. Glad you could be with us today. I preach for the Church of Christ here in Wadsworth, Ohio, and I'm glad to have you be a part of our program. We're talking about a series of lessons about the New Testament Christian. These are based on a lectureship that I attended in Memphis at the Memphis School of Preaching. Show you a little bit. This is the auditorium that is built within the school that allows students to come there to practice their lessons or uh, to have their devotionals or maybe they might have a guest speaker come in. Uh, it's a very nice facility they have. It's nice that they can construct their own auditorium independent of the one there at the church building that they use that they can use privately and not disturb others or things like that just as convenience may dictate. We're talking today about the idea of a New Testament Christian lives a pure life. And you would think that that kind of subject would be something that, you know, you're going to hear a lot about because really people expect Christians, if people are Christians, they expect them to live a pure life. But sometimes it's difficult for Christians to, you know, we're supposed to be uh, in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. And sometimes those lines between those two different concepts can be very difficult. Uh, maybe you've been in a situation you could think of in work or maybe in school or, or something like that where maybe something started out one way and by the time things rolled along and some events occurred, you might have thought, you know, if this is what I thought it was going to be, I would have never been involved in it in the first place. Well, you know, Christians are not immune to that same kind of thing. You know, we try to be uh, friendly with people, we try to be involved in their lives, but we still have to recognize that as Christians, we are to live a life of purity. Notice this statement from the lectureship book on the New Testament Christian. The lecturer is Michael Bates. He made this statement, Purity is one of the most fundamental characteristics for the children of God. Having been defiled by sin, Revelation 3:4. One who obeys the gospel is washed from sin in the blood of Jesus, Revelation 1.5. Peter declared this when he wrote to the early Christians, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, 1 Peter 1.22. The truth is the word of God, as Jesus prayed for his disciples, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, John 17.17. 17. Therefore, no cleansing from sin can be enjoined until one has submitted to God in obedience to his word. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Here's a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about as it relates to a Christian lives a pure life. We'll talk about the idea of a purity begun, and then purity lost, and then purity restored, and then purity lived, and purity sustained. You might think about the idea of purity begun, and, and I asked some people uh, through some of my contacts, you know, wh when you think of purity, what do you think of? And the, the response I got most was a newborn child. You might be surprised to realize that there are religious groups out there that think that a child that's born is born with sin, tainted with sin. Maybe they might not call it that. They may call it something like original sin or a fancy term, total hereditary depravity or Adam's sin. You know, when people have this idea, some religious groups have the idea that the sin of Adam that he committed way back in the garden follows down generation by generation through the sin of the flesh. Since we're all flesh, there's all that connection. And they have this idea, this teaching that sin is inherited. So when you look at a newborn child, some of these religious groups teach that this child is born with sin. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Let's take a look at Ezekiel chapter 18, 19 through 20, and let's read it together. Yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the son has done what is lawful and right, and has kept all my statutes and observed them. He shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. You see, when you talk about the purity of a baby, a newborn child, purity begun. We begin our lives pure. It's interesting, you know, the first person I baptized, baptized someone in Parma, Ohio. 
he had a little girl, and he loved this little girl. I didn't know the man. I was a guest speaker there. He wanted to be baptized. And, you know, when you come, and you, want, you want to make that kind of a big decision. And we don't know who you are. I didn't know him. The congregation didn't know him. I was visiting myself. And so we like to make sure that people understand what they're doing. I mean, it's not, if, if it's just, if baptism was just merely a dunking in water, which some people claim the church teaches, which is a slanderous report, you have to have faith. If you have faith, you have to know what you're doing. You have to understand it. That's the prerequisite you bring. You have to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Those are things an infant cannot do. But anyway, his parents and his family were pressuring him to have his child sprinkled, to get away, uh, get rid of Adam's sin, original sin, or hereditary depravity. And he looked at that baby, and he said, this is the most pure thing that I will ever witness until I see God himself. And he could not accept that. Notice this passage in Matthew chapter 18, 1 through 5. Notice what Jesus is saying here. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him on in the midst of them, and said, For surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as his little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. So you see, when we begin our lives, when we're born, the, the, mo the purest, the most innocent is that of a newborn baby or that baby in the mother's womb. That's sacred. Our country, you know, they don't recognize that. And if our country doesn't change, it's going to pay a high price for cheapening of life without respecting the sanctity of life. But anyway, when we begin our lives, we begin pure. But then all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden, but in time we develop and we become more learned and we learn about life and things like that. And we learn about different things. We actually lose our purity, purity lost. Take a look at this passage in James chapter 1, 12 through 15. Blessed is a man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You know, it's interesting that sometimes, you know, people, they want to blame God. You know, they, they commit the sin. They have the consequences of it, and they want to blame God for it. They don't seem to recognize that, you know, God recognized that man has this problem of sin. So much so, in John 3:16, he sent his own son to provide the solution for that. But sometimes people don't recognize that. Sometimes people, they would rather blame somebody else. They would rather blame God for their predicament. Or maybe they might go the other way. They may say, well, you know, Satan made me do it. You know, there used to be a comedian who used to make his living that way, blaming everything on the devil or Satan. It, it, sometimes people don't want to accept the fact that they have committed sin. I mean, think about it in your own life. How easy is it for you to say, I was wrong? Now, we may say that if we drop a pencil or something. But I mean, if, we, if it's something significant, if it really goes to our character, our being, how hard is it for us to say, I have sinned? It's really difficult. It's challenging. But we need to recognize that as you know, we, we're born innocent, we're children, we're innocent, as we become adults, we are enticed to commit sin, we succumb to that tempta temptation, we commit sin, and we lose our purity. You know, there is a consequence. Some people, you know, they don't want to hear anything about what God says. They don't want to know anything about it. And, and there's a consequence from that. Notice here in Romans chapter 1, 28 through 32, it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, 
They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. You know, that's a really long list, and those, some of those items in that list, you don't need me to tell you that our society has all kinds of these kinds of things going on. And what's our society doing? It's continuing to push God, push the Bible, push, you know, I'll use the term Judeo-Christian ethics if you want. Push all that out. And then we wonder why our society is crumbling. We, we can see the increase of these things in our own society. And yet we scratch our heads. But yet the Bible says, you know, these people didn't retain God. They didn't respect him or his word. They shoved it out and these things came in. Why would we be surprised it's not the case today? It's interesting, you know, some people think that Christians somehow don't realize that sin is pleasurable. You don't deny that. Now, that might surprise you. Not everything about sin is pleasurable, but there is pleasure in sin. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 11, 24 through 25, makes this statement, and this may surprise you. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the, children, with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. See, the, the Bible doesn't, you know, it doesn't deny that there is pleasure in some sin. It tells you that. It warns you about it. But it's temporary. It's fleeting. It's temporal. Moses recognized that it was far better to be a child of God than it would be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, what that means is he could have anything he want. He could have anything his heart desired whatever it might have been. Well, let's go on. You know, let's take a look at, you know, in a, an adult Bible class I was teaching the other night, we talked about the subject of sin taxes. And it's interesting, you know, I'll put this up here, you can look at it while we talk about it, but you know, some, some people talk about, you know, you can't say that what I'm doing is wrong. You just can't say it. You can't say that what I'm doing, I'm committing a sin. You, that's just un-American, or whatever term they want to use. It's, it's amazing sometimes what they'll come up with. But I sort of find it ironic, and this is something that was brought up in our class, was the idea of sin taxes. You know, we, you know and here in Ohio, not too long ago, you know, we're going to vote, or we've already voted, on whether or not we're going to renew the sin tax. You know, we have sports facilities need to be built and all that, and we have these group of taxes that we call sin taxes. And we recognize them as things that really aren't all that beneficial to society, but we still want the money. Things like alcohol, tobacco, gambling. In, in the Wikipedia here, they even have things like causing air pollution and things like that. I also underline the statement, some jurisdictions have also le um, levied taxes on illegal drugs, such as marijuana. That statement's sort of interesting to me because I'm like, well, how can you do that on an illegal drug? But obviously they're talking about places like Colorado where they've legalized marijuana. You know, how far are we willing to go? I mean, really. When I was in junior high, in high school, our teachers warned us over and over and over again, stay away from marijuana. Stay away from it. It's a drug. It will do you no good. Well, now, let's legalize it so we can get taxes from it. I mean, how far is that going to go? Up where I live, we have an epidemic of heroin overdose. Now, what's our solution to that going to be? Should we legalize that? You can get a prescription. We'll make sure your needles are clean. I mean, we're, we're, how far are we going to go with this, the sin taxes? But anyway, I want you to recognize, though, that we have no problem calling <laughs> those sin taxes. Well, by whose definition? You know, whose definition are we going to use? Whose standards are we going to use when we say something is sin or not? Is it going to be the vote of a group of people? Is it going to be a vote of the people in this, you know, Columbus, this capital of Ohio? Is it going to be a group of people in Washington, D.C.? 
Who makes the determination of what sin is, what is sin and what is not? That's a serious question. That authority resides with God, not man, not man. But let's move on. What about purity restored? Now we recognize we're born pure, and we do things, we lose that purity. How do we get it back? I mean, I mean, how do we make ourselves pure again? You know, some of the consequences we'll never get rid of. Some of the things are so, I mean, we can get rid of the sin, we can get forgiveness, but the consequences remain. And sometimes people don't understand that. But how can we get that back? Well, take a look here in Acts 22:16. Ananias is on the scene. He's talking to Saul of Tarsus, and he makes this statement, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it's interesting, you talk to some people, and they'll try to tell you that Saul was baptized on the road, on the way, before Ananias came to him. Now, that's what they'll say. They'll say he was, he was saved as soon as the light came on. You know, because the light, great light appeared to him. It was Jesus. And they'll say, well, he was saved then. But this conversation with Ananias will come later. It wasn't right then. He wasn't saved yet. Some people, you know, they have this idea, you know, they'll, they'll attack churches of Christ and Christians. And they'll say, you know, you guys immerse in water, which is baptism. And they'll say, you keep talking about water, water, water. That's all you're talking about. And sometimes they'll use some rather not very flattering terms about it. They'll say we're waterlogged or things like that. And they try to deny that water has anything to do with it. Does it? Well, let's look at this passage. Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. It goes on, it says, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That's Ephesians chapter 5. 25 through 27. Notice the phrase there. Here, I'll underline it for you. Let's just see it again. Washing of water by the word. Water is there. It's there. Now, some people will say, well, you know, baptism doesn't save. You can't produce a single passage that says that baptism has anything to do with salvation. I actually had someone uh, I was talking to make a statement. I was at a fair one time. And this guy was operating a booth. I've seen him before. And, and then the Gideons, they were down there a little bit of ways. And, and it was an interesting conversation because this guy was saying, you can't show anywhere in the Bible that baptism saves. And I, and I asked him, he said, and he even said, you Church of Christ people, <laughs> he knew who I was, can't produce a single passage. Well, I told him, and I also told the other guy down at the Gideon booth, when I talked to him about it, to read this passage, 1 Peter chapter 3, 20 through 21. Here, let's read it together. It says, Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I underlined it there for you. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. And notice he has, not the removal of the filth of the flesh. I mean, that would just be a dunking in water. But it's the answer of a good conscience towards God. And to have a good conscience towards God, you have to know who God is. You have to know what God's will is. You have to know you have to respond. You have to have faith. You, you, you have to believe. You have to make the determination you're going to do that. That's repentance. You're going to turn away from your life, and you're going to do what the Scriptures teach. That's repentance. You have to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You to, those are prerequisites. Baptism is more than just a dunk tank. You know, baptism in the Bible is not just a getting wet experience. Nobody teaches that at Churches of Christ. We teach what the New Testament teaches. You have to believe. You have to repent. You have to confess. Those things are prerequisites to baptism. But let me go on, you know, the idea of purity restored, you know, once, once it happens, you know, we can't have anything to do with sin. We have to do everything we can to abstain from it. 
Take a look at this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. Now, I could read this to you, but you could see the words there. But I want to underline and point out to you verse, the last part there, verse 11. And such were some of you. Why were they that? This is a church at Corinth. Why were they? Because they repented. And also, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You see, the church at Corinth, they lived lives of fornication and idolatry and adultery and homosexuality and sodomites, thieves and covenants. They lived those things, but they weren't those things anymore. They had repented of those things. They stopped doing them. And they were immersed in water to wash those sins away. And then they stayed away from them. See, their purity was restored. Well, we have to live lives of purity. Live them. Well, take a look at this, these, two, these two passages. I put them side by side. I don't have time to read them. But you can see the terms that I underlined there. It doesn't take you very long to figure out which ones are the works of the flesh and which ones are the fruit of the Spirit, does it? Now ask yourself, in our land today, do we need more of the one on the left or more of the one on the right? Something that we need to ask ourselves. Well, notice what Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 through 11. This, this is another passage that he talks about these, you know, faith and virtue and knowledge and, and self-control. All these, these Christian graces sometimes are called. We need, you know, as a Christian living that life, we need to have these fruits of the Spirit. Sometimes they're called that. And it's interesting, in Matthew chapter 7, 16 through 20, you know, I put that on the side there so you can see this is Jesus speaking, and he points out, you know, you will know them by their fruits. Talk about false teachers, by what they do, by what they say, how they live. Well, you know, the same thing is true when you, when it takes, you come to talk about a New Testament Christian. You know, you're going to know by the things that a Christian says, by the things that a Christian does, the kind of lives that they live, you're going to recognize, you're going to say, well, you know what, um, that's wrong and that's right. And you're going to be able, you know, what you're doing there, for some of you who may not realize it, when you look at a Christian and you say, well, that person's a hypocrite because they didn't do this or they did that. You know what they call that? You know, when we do it to them, they would call that judging. You have no right to judge us. But they could do it to us all day long. But you see, it isn't a matter of, you know, judging the person or judging that. No, what really matters is, do we live our lives in accordance with the New Testament? Do we live pure lives? And if we don't, what do we do? How do we, how do we keep ourselves pure? How do we do that? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 15, 16 through 20. So Jesus said, Are you also without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes in the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, and so on. You have to guard your life against these things. But you need to recognize they start in the heart. They start in the heart. They start with your thinking. You really have to pay attention to that. You really have to pay attention to your thoughts. That's where this stuff starts. But let's take a look at Philippians chapter 4, 8 through 9. The Apostle Paul gave a list. This is a very good list of things to help us with our hearts and the things that we think about. These are some of the things that we should focus our attention on. But what if we sin? Well, let's look at 1 John chapter 1, 6 through 8, and notice what it says about how we sustain our purity. This is 1 John chapter 1, 6 through 8. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You see, when you walk in the light, the blood of Christ cleanses you continually from all sin. But you have to walk in the light. You have to walk in the light. So, a New Testament... Christian lives a pure life. You begin pure, you're going to lose it. You can regain it thanks to the work of Christ. You have to live a life of following Christ, and you're going to be dependent upon Christ all the days of your life to remain pure. 
Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there, and sadly, so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns, on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion, or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then, once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.